All right, um, we're in this awesome series called Born is the King. And please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 while you're turning there. My hope is that, um, do we have that picture ready, Ben? Do we have that, Dominic, do we have that picture ready? Uh, we, Gail and I visited my uh, Arizona family. My daughter, Melissa, and, and her family live out there in Arizona. And um, this, see the one that's in front of me? That's Jesse. And so he's three. And my hope is that you don't listen to the sermon the way that Jesse opened our gifts for Christmas. So Gail had a bag, and it was all filled with all kinds of things. And on the top was clothing, and on the bottom was the really good stuff. But he didn't know that. This is how he opened the gift. He opens the bag, and it goes like this. There was about four pieces of clothing, and they went like this. <laughs> Until he got to the battery-powered fish that actually swim in his pond. So anyways, I hope, I hope you uh, would value everything that the Lord has is, is given uh, to, to speak today. Um, we're going to just read this section of Scripture, but before we do, actually, uh, I would like us to go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, and in it you will see the Jesus was born. Um, so we're going to go to 1 John 3, 8. And you say, please ask me the question, why was Jesus born? What cooperation? <laughs> Caleb, thank you. Please ask me the question, why was Jesus born? Awesome. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. How's that for an answer? Um, now, <clears throat> we are going to examine this passage of Scripture that you've probably never heard for a Christmas message. It's found in Genesis 3, and hopefully you turn there by now. And it's an unusual passage. It's a unique passage. But actually, it basically is saying that Jesus was born to destroy the works of the devil because he was destroying the works of the devil for us so we could be freed from his oppressive power. All right, so uh, let's read the scripture, and then we'll pray. How's that sound? Sound good? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? You want to know how the serpent deceives? He'll start to question the authority, the validity of God's word. And if you give in, then it, your, your life will go an entirely different direction than if you actually believe the word of God and submit to it, okay? So did he actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, hold on. Right off the bat, he's trying to deceive Eve because God did not say that. He didn't say that you couldn't eat of He actually says, there's a whole bunch, eat from any tree except for one, one prohibition. Just don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he's twisting God's word. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. I love it. Eve got it right. She knows what, so far, she knows what the word of God said. She knows that, no, 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 you're wrong, Satan. And she's doing a good job withstanding his deception up until that point. All right, but then it, it goes south. But God said, uh, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it. Now, uh, this is really important. She, God never said you can't touch it. He said you can't eat it. So now then there's a vulnerability to her understanding of God's word. And wherever there's a vulnerability is where the enemy can try to sow seeds to deceive us and get us off, tra off track. You with me? But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. So now he full on is raging against God's word and trying to get her to disbelieve as if God is holding out on something good that she otherwise could have, right? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. How cynical and twisted that is. He's saying, 
hey, you can actually be like God. Never before had they been tempted. Never be, they were completely uh, content and they, they enjoyed their relationship with God. Everything was perfect, as I'll talk about in a moment. Everything was beautiful. They walked with God in the cool of the day. But now the tempter came and offered something that, is, that, that, that actually wasn't true, but it seemed to appeal. And that's where we get tempted. That something that God forbids us, we're actually attracted to. And we, we are we're, we're like, like, a, a piece, like a magnet to a piece of steel. We're drawn to it. It's forbidden because why? We don't trust God. And then only to find out that we trespassed and then our lives begin to go down the terrible road. And that's why Paul says in Romans 8, Paul the Apostle says that uh, the mind that is controlled by the sinful nature leads to death. Things die off, right? All right. So uh, he, he, ba he basically completely questions God's authority. Um, so then, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes... Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. All those things seem so good. How many of you found out that, when, um, that all sin promises to please, but in the end it only enslaves us and dominates our life? Anybody more than me said, man, I've been there, done that. I actually have the t-shirt for that one. Right? She, saw, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Many people don't realize that Adam was right there with her the whole time. He wasn't off somewhere fishing in some, some pond in Eden. He was there. Now, what's wrong with that? All right, I want to I spend a, a little bit of time talking about that. What's wrong with that? See, Adam was the one that got the first-hand command before Eve was even created from Adam's side. Did you know that? God is the one that said, hey, Adam, there's all these yes trees. You, you can just enjoy them. Enjoy everything I've created. But there's one tree that I command you, don't, don't eat of it, because when you do, you will surely die. They were never meant to die. They were to live, and God created for them to live in this gorgeous beautiful, perfect habitation forever and never to die. And so when, when uh, now let's fast forward, Eve was then, cre you know, uh, created out of Adam's rib. And now who does Satan go to in this story? Does he go to Adam who had direct revelation from God or does he go to Eve? He goes to Eve who got secondhand revelation, but she didn't, understand it or get it right at the time so what happened is you would expect that Adam the husband don't worry Adam's going to speak up Adam's going to preach God's word he's going to protect his wife he's going to protect all humanity but does he Adam was silent the whole time he's completely silent and this is kind of a common plague I think uh, in our world is that Men, us men, sometimes abdicate our position to spiritually protect our family. It's almost like we ignore the spiritual realm because we're working so hard in the physical realm and we're kind of taking care of our bodies and our minds, but we're not be becoming the heads of, of our family spiritually. And this is what plunged all of humanity into the trouble that we got into. Sin and wickedness and evil and death and everything because, because Adam didn't speak up when, we, when she needed a preacher in the garden. Adam was silent. And I'm here to say, men of God, men, let's not be silent when our family needs the word of God. They need to have the spirit of God leading us. We need to spiritually protect our children from the onslaughts of the enemy that are coming in and, and trying to steal their minds. Let's be men of God that say, I'm going to lead my family spiritually and not allow them to plunge into a life that does not know the word of God and does not get the guidance of the word. Can I get a, can I get a little? Yeah, yeah. Praise God. Praise God for that. 
Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. You see, what sin did is it brought onto humanity something foreign that they had not ever known before, and that is guilt, shame, fear, and hiding. They're hiding. They're sowing fig leaves. Why? Because they, everything was wholesome. Sex was, uh, for, first God married them in chapter 2, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply. Have a blast. Enjoy each other. It was good. It was holy. It was pure. As the moment that Satan uh, tempted them to fall into sin, everything became perverted. Everything became perverted. You know, God made them male and female. And then he said, he, he brought them into a covenant with, where the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one. It says in uh, Genesis 2, uh, 24, 25, and they were both naked and unashamed in the garden. It was beautiful. It was good. And then as soon as the enemy deceived them, everything, things became perverted. And now we're in a mess. <laughs> we're in a mess. How many of you think we need a savior? We need a savior, right? So what the fig leaves are is, listen, watch this. Don't miss this. What the fig leaves are is man's attempt to cover up. We can no longer be transparent. We can no longer be vulnerable. We have to cover up because there's a hidden us. We're afraid to let the real us out there for, because now we're afraid of God. We're afraid of judgment. We're afraid of all these things. So if I cover up, maybe I can even hide it from God. How many of you know that'll never work? Right? So um, there they are sowing fig leaves. Remember that. And uh, made themselves loincloths. They covered up. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. First time they ever hid from God. They had this beautiful love relationship where they walked and talked with him in the cool of the day. But the Lord God called to the man. Have you ever done this with your kids? Ask them questions when you know they did something wrong. You want to see if they'll repent? You want to see if they'll admit to it? Uh, Johnny, what is, what is it that you just did to your sister in the room? You know, because you really want to have mercy on them and help, hopefully they'll admit what they did. Uh, and he said, uh, he, uh, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Fear, guilt, hiding, shame. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me. It's all her fault. Praise God for that. I just blame Gail when things go wrong. <laughs> Not really. Only once in a while, right, Gail? The woman you gave me. She gave me the fruit of the tree. What a wimp. <laughs> How did Adam become such a wimp so quick? Oh, my gosh. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The devil made me do it. How many of you are old enough to remember Flip Wilson? All right, I've got about 17 of you guys here. Praise God. You're up in my level. The devil made me do it. The Lord God said to the serpent, Ser serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And um, on your belly shall you go and dust you shall eat. That's where we get the term, eat my dust. All the days of your life I will put. Now this is the verse that we're going to really focus on. I will put, and let's, let's actually read this out loud together. All of us together. You ready? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is God speaking up and prophesying when Adam should have preached and he was silent. God decided not to be silent. And he had to preach and prophesy a message that all humanity needed to hear. And it's going to be really fun because I'm going to unpack verse 15. But let's, get, let's come back to that in a little bit. Uh, then verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. 
Now, Gail knows of this pain in childbirth because you probably know what happened in 1995. We brought triplets home for Christmas. And if anybody knows about the pain of childbirth, I'll never forget when she was about eight months and, you know, fairly, fairly large for a petite woman like she is. One day she was having an emotional day and she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, you did this to me. Can you imagine? I just blame the devil. <laughs> and to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You see, Adam was, was created to work and produce, and that's what God calls us first to do, men, to work. But now, now and, and women, we all work, but now he is going to have to do it by the sweat of his brow because the ground is cursed, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken for death. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Never meant to go back to dust. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, I want you to catch this, our last verse. And the Lord God made Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed him. I'm going to say that one more time. And the Lord God made Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Okay. All right, you ready? I want to give you kind of a little contextual background. And also, this context of this passage is also kind of like the, uh, the plot line of the Bible. It's like a biblical plot line, if we could have that slide. Watch this. Um, so, in this story, we kind of see the whole story of the Bible. Soon, they will turn to that slide. Um, and what you'll see is creation, fall, judgment, redemption, restoration. So the first thing that we see is this. You ready? In chapter 1 and 2, you see this beautiful story of creation. You see how God created everything. And what do you read there? You see that, man, he made everything, the skies and the water and the sun and the moon and everything. And on earth, especially in, in Eden, what, 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 what do you see in Eden? You see these beautiful rivers, beautiful blue rivers. You see the, the greenery, perfect greenery. It says that God made trees that were pleasing to the eye everywhere you looked. And he made, he made a man and a woman and he created marriage and he created work and they got to be productive and God gave them uh, dominion over everything. I mean, it, it just is so good. Everything was, they didn't sweat. They didn't have, they wouldn't have had pain in childbirth. Everything was just so beautiful. A perfect climate, no blizzards. Uh, there, there, was no, uh, there was no hurricanes or fires. There was no earthquakes. There was no horrible, like, 20-degree temperatures like we have here, below zero temperatures. It was perfect. That's why they could go around naked. <laughs> um, they had perfect bodies. Remember, they were naked and unashamed, right? How cool is that? You guys don't know what to do with that. Just laugh. It's okay. How cool is that? Are you naked and unashamed? I mean, that's awesome. God made everything good. And they're, they're married and they're connected. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Adam's like, I'm going to give you a name. It's like, whoa, man, I'm going to call you woman because you're beautiful. Bad joke. I don't blame you for not laughing. Uh, and, and it's so perfect. So creation, they had everything, everything, everything perfect. There was only one prohibition. Just one, don't eat of that tree. What do they do? The serpent wants to, wants to, he was jealous of humankind, so he attacks humankind, and he gets them to submit to his authority, to his voice. Uh, he convinced Eve that he was holding out, and he exaggerated the prohibition. So he accentuated, exaggerated the prohibition, of what you should, the only one thing you should not do. And that's what he does. He gets us, he persuaded Eve that 
God was being miserly in his graciousness. Just because there was one thing that he said, do not eat of. Have this, all of this beauty. Have it all. All my creation is yours. Take dominion. But the one thing that they weren't to have is what Satan caused them to be tempted to do and plunge them into the fall of humanity. And then from there you see the judgment. God, God always judges sin. There's a trilogy of judgments because um, the, snake, the serpent got cursed. The, the, the woman would experience pain in childbirth. The man would experience the sweat of his brow and pain and toil in work. And we know that both men and women work, so don't worry. I'm not saying that they don't. <laughs> Just saying the, the things that were doled out here. And, um, and then what's amazing in all this, and maybe you missed it. Do you, do, don't you hate when you watch a movie and you missed a crucial part? You missed a crucial part? Maybe you missed this crucial part. There's a redemption story in there. Did you know that? I would expect now that God would say, hey, you violated my command. You know what? I'm leaving you alone. Save yourselves. Good riddance. I did all this for you, and you just turned and snubbed your nose at me, and you went and listened to the serpent, and all he is a deceiver. You'd think that God would say, I'm done. I'm walking away from the relationship. But instead, he planted a verse in there where God himself spoke, and it is a verse that shows redemption. Because when he said this verse, when he said, uh, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and she shall, uh, you shall bruise his heel. He's saying to the serpent, there is a seed that's coming from the woman that is going to have the power to deal a fatal blow to your authority, he's going to crush your head because you have plunged my people, my children, into this life of chaos and sin, and I'm not going to let you get away with this forever. There is somebody coming down the line. You can trace the genealogy. He's going to come from, um, from you know, from Adam, but it's going to, then it's going to, you can trace it to Abraham, where Abraham in chapter 22 says that uh, God said, that they, I will give you a seed, and from that seed, it, uh, this seed, he will bless all of the nations. My friends, he's talking about Jesus. Several times over and over again, God tells Abraham that he's going to have offspring, and from his seed, you know, think about the word seed, everybody say seed. And then in the Hebrew, it's zera. And that word zera, or seed, is meant to be a collective word, which results in a singular term. So it, 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 um, what happens is all down the corridors of time throughout the Old Testament, God keeps saying to Abraham, and then to, I, to Jacob, then from Jacob, he has 12 children. He says, from the line of Judah is going to come the Messiah. And then Throughout Judah's line, there's a man named Jesse. He says, from your line is going to come the Messiah. Who happened to have David as a son? From David's line is going to come the Messiah. God's planting all these prophecies speaking about the one that would come. And it started right there in Genesis 3.15, which is an ultimate Christmas story because we know why the Son of God came. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. And it started right there in Genesis 3.15 because God's not done with you. Yes, you have. Yes, you have failed God. Yes, you have sinned against him. But right in the... For the very, very first transgression in the beginning of time, at the very first transgression, God said, I'm going to redeem them. I'm going to redeem them. How awesome is that? I get excited about this. Why Jesus was born. Number one, to go to war. Everybody look at that screen. Number one, the first reason why Jesus was born, to go to war. He says, I will put enmity between your seed, the serpent's seed, is anyone who chooses not to submit to the authority of Christ, ultimately. Not to submit to the authority of God. 
Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, the enemies of Christ. So what happens is you, you, you only have one father. It's either the devil or it's God. And if we are not submitted to the Lordship of Christ, the one that made the way for us to have a bridge to God the Father, then we basically are not under the fatherhood of God. Did you know that? If we're not submitted to God's authority, then he's not our father. If we have not believed and trusted Christ as our Savior, the only provision that God made for us to have access to the Father, then our Father, as Jesus said to, I think it was the, the Pharisees or the teachers of the law, he says, you are of your father the devil. Can you imagine hearing that? And these are the religious guys. He said, your dad, he's the devil. <laughs> and my dad's better than your dad. <laughs> he didn't say that. I used to say that a lot. He, he, he declared war. Uh, Jesus was born to, de uh, God declared war, and that was why Jesus came to, to go to war. And here's what, listen to this. Don't miss this. It's as if God was saying, Satan, if you're going to bring sin into the world through a woman, I'm going to bring a savior into the world through a woman. Because remember it said, he says, uh, I'll put enmity between uh, your offspring and hers, right? And, and, and he, will crush, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. I know that's like, um, this is all going to come to light. It's going to come into focus as time goes. So um, this is a messianic prophecy. It's called the first gospel. Tell the person next to you, this is the first gospel. It's the first gospel. Okay, enough talking. It's a messianic. Now, here's some truths, three truths under my first point that, that uh, show that he's the Messiah. This is interesting. Don't miss this. Number one, how do, how do we know that the seed of the woman is Messiah? First of all, we know that be this seed coming, ultimately Jesus, must be divine. Why? Because the seed is passed along by the man. So right away we have a harmonizing of Genesis 3.15 with Isaiah 7. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? Huh? God with us. Whoa. So we, we know that through this little verse here, that because there's, it's not the seed of the man, it's the seed of the woman, that means that God ultimately is the father, and we can, we can go right from Eden all the way to Bethlehem. And this, this, this sees Bethlehem from 4,000 years B.C. Crazy stuff. God is so good. God couldn't wait to announce it. It's like, it's like he couldn't hold it back. It's like me. I can't wait to tell good stories. You know how hard it was for me to, to keep the fact that, that you gave $1.6 million, pledged or gave? I had to do that for two weeks. God is just like me. He's like right in the beginning. He tells the story. He can't keep it in. I love that. By the way, there's some people in my family you can't tell secrets to. I will not tell you who it is, but they will, they will break the secret. We have to plan birthdays without this person knowing. And then we tell them at the end. Oh, I just said him. Oh, sorry, Ralph. Oh, sorry, Ralph. Did I say Ralph? Where are you? Um, Second thing, so he's divine birth, then Messiah will go to war as a supernatural being. We know that this person in verse 15 must be supernatural. Why? Because no human can overcome and destroy the serpent. The serpent is, the devil wasn't necessarily the serpent, but the devil used the serpent to do his bidding. Does that make sense? So um, the curse for the serpent was really pointed to Satan the ultimate serpent, described in Revelation as the great red dragon. All right? Um, and, and so it, he must be supernatural because he can crush Satan. And the last thing is that Messiah will be of the human race. Why? Because he's born of a woman. Right? So now what do we have here? We have, we have a God and a man at the same time. Jesus was all God and all man. He did not relinquish his divinity when he came. He did not relinquish. The, he was all God at the same time, all man. And so that's why he had the authority to do 
what he did. And that's why his, his uh, you know, sacrifice at the cross was the only way to pay for our, our sin. All right, the first one is that Jesus was born to go to war. Second one is to crush Satan's head. I love it. I love that point. Jesus was born to crush Satan's head. And you go, that's a weird point. It's true, though, isn't it? It's true. Genesis 3.15, it says, he shall bruise your head. And when you look at the Hebrew word, if anybody cares, it's shoop. Tell your neighbor, shoop, shoop. Shoop means to crush or attack or bruise. In other words, it's not pretty. Uh, basically, what God is forecasting, what he's prophesying is that, um, that he's going to have a crushed head. So the serpent's head, that place of authority, that place that he rules, his headship, his authority over people is going to ultimately be gone. Now, um, in, in the fall, we had creation in the fall, man was given dominion over the earth as vice regents for God to represent his kingdom on planet earth. And so, but Adam and Eve came under some of Satan's authority um, and they capitulated or they gave in, they caved in to the serpent's temptation. And so what happened was they were subjected more and more to Satan's power. So their level of dominion diminished and they no longer could function in the, in the top dead center of their, of their ultimate purpose because Satan had come in and robbed them of this temporarily right everybody say temporarily now then that's the fall but God was announcing here the ultimate end to the influence and the power of Satan over humanity do you know this thing all comes to an end we had shootings this week again. Aren't you just so tired of it? I'm so tired of the political division and the hatred and the vitriolic and I'm tired of racism and I'm tired of murder and I'm tired of attacks on Christian people. I'm tired of hearing about the martyrs all over the world that are suffering and are being punished and imprisoned and having heads cut. I'm tired of the wickedness. And God forecasted and prophesied it all comes to an end. His head will be crushed. That means that all evil will come to an end. If you don't know what lies ahead for your future in Christ, then you will not live for him today. Jesus Christ is coming back again. Now, um, I had a friend, his name, was, uh, his name was Bill DeRoss. And so I was at his house and I was working on his house and I was up on a ladder years ago, probably in the 90s, early 90s or so. And I'm up there on the ladder and I see him. He's kind of got the day off and he's work, working around his garden. And so what he's doing is I see him with like a pipe or something and he's smashing the ground over and over again. I'm like, what is my friend Bill doing? That's just weird. I said, what are you doing, Bill? He goes, well, I got a snake down here and he won't die. And I said, where are you hitting him? Well, I'm smashing him in the tail. And I said, you're never gonna kill him by smashing him in the tail. You gotta hit him in the head. So he goes, oh, okay, smash. Now, I'm not an advocate of violence, but I don't like snakes. Don't report me, okay? So now the snake is dead. And here's what I wanna say to you. Adam and Eve went down because they let that talking head influence them. They let hell's voice become more authoritative than heaven's voice. How do you hear heaven's voice? By becoming students of the word. I'm gonna tell you, the serpent wants to pervert God's creative order, how God designed us in every way, shape, or form. And that has to do with sexuality. God has a plan, and it's good. That has to do with gender. God has a plan, and it's good. And it's written right in his scripture. God has a plan with everything about life. If you want to know, if you want to hear heaven's voice and not be destroyed, not your family be destroyed or your marriages be destroyed or your business to be destroyed, then when you have a decision to make, you have a decision to either hear from uh, the authoritative voice of heaven or the authoritative voice of hell. And which voice you are guided by and make decisions by will be determined whether you choose life or death. You'll either see your family destroyed 
and you'll see a mess made. Or if you go to God's word and say, I'm going to take the pipe. And whenever that ridiculous serpent, lying, deceptive serpent tries to destroy my life, I'm going to take a pipe and hit him in the head. That's what Jesus did. Every time Satan tried to tempt him and get tempt him and get him off his track, get him off the reason that he came. Uh, every time he did that by offering kingdoms and saying, oh, if you float down here, everybody's going to worship you. Jesus said, it is written. I'm going to turn to the word of God. I'm going to block out hell's voice and I'm going to listen to heaven's voice because I'm going to go by what my father says. You're a lying, conniving, deceptive devil and you'll never do good for me. So who are we going to listen to? I'm talking about the little things in our life too. The little things. The world Satan has influence in the world and the culture is being shaped by hell's voice more than heaven's voice. And if we let ourselves slip slide away because we're seeing this family and that political person speak up and, and run a platform on abortion or whatever, if we, if we allow the cultural norms and the cultural patterns to shape the decisions of what we do, then guess what? Hell's voice, that serpent is guiding your life and he'll never, he'll never guide you to heaven. He'll never guide you to greater life. He will destroy your life. But oh, God knew that and he has a plan. He has a plan. Listen, Satan would get you to think that if you just don't listen to those Christians, don't listen to that archaic Bible, do whatever you want sexually. Sleep with whomever you want. Don't get into a marriage covenant. That's just, does God really say that? Does he really mean that? Go ahead, and, and if you do that, you will see some levels of how he can hurt your life and destroy your life. Oh, I love that God saw all this. He saw brokenness of mankind, and he still had a plan. Oh, man, I'm fired up, you guys. I gotta take a water break. Wow. My wife, Gail, is pretty awesome. Do you know Gail? You know her? So one day, one day I get a phone call from her. It's during the daytime. Now let me give you, I got to back up the story a little bit. At our house, we have this tree as you're coming up to the door. It looks like kind of like a Christmas tree. And birds have, over the years, um, made their nest in there, at least two or three times, I think. We've lived there now for 17 years. And we would sit up on the porch with our coffee in this particular time when this, this um, you know, the wife and the husband bird made a nest and they were like nurturing the nest and we saw the eggs come and wow, it's really cool. And then we watched and we could peer into it. Then we saw the little chicks break through the eggs and we like adopted these little chicks. We, we just loved these little chicks, right? And we would go out and have coffee and look at them and <clears throat> it, was, it was so awesome. And so one day Gail came home and I was at work and she says, Neil, I don't want to know what to do. She's frantic. What does she see? She sees that there was a snake in our tree and his head was popped out, maybe about five and a half feet or so up. And he's got one of the chicks in his mouth. She said, I'm really mad about this. I, I don't know who, you, you went and you grabbed from the utensil draw, she grabbed the salad tongs <laughs> and went and took that snake by the head and ripped him out of that tree. And she called me, she goes, what do I do now? I said, get the baseball bat and smash his head. <laughs> I got this violent streak in me. She did, my wife did that. She did that. Now here's what she did. She saved the other chicks so that this dastardly snake couldn't take their lives. Now here's a little point I wanna make. Along the way, at, well, as the snake was destroying her, her family, she was dive bombing this thing, but she didn't have power over the snake. She needed somebody else to come. She needed a savior to come because she didn't have the power over the snake. She needed someone with a higher authority to come, that, that mom, mommy bird. I'm sure the dad was there trying to be a hero too. But, and, and so she needed, a, she needed Gail to come and, and for her to come and take care of this because the bird couldn't fix it. I'm going to tell you something. We're, we're like those mom and dad birds. 
The serpent is trying to make a mess out of our families, our children, our grandkids. And you got to be like God. You got to be like, no, enough is enough. I'm declaring war. And, and that head's going to be crushed because I'm going to let, I want my children to be raised on the word. Nothing more than the word. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what a politician says. I care about what God's word says. That's what I care about. That's what I can. And do you know our nation, to the degree that our nation moves away from the authority of Scripture, is how we're getting in a worse mess every decade. It's getting crazier and crazier. And that's why God wants to raise up a resurrected church who will believe in the word, proclaim the word, get filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaim it, and go out there and love on people. It's time for a revival in America. And what better place than to start right here in America's hometown where it all started. That's why, by the way, I'm throwing this one in. <laughs> Greg Laurie, uh, an incredible evangelist, says, said yes to my, uh, my big ask to come and do an evangelistic night here in Plymouth. How cool is that? Okay, all of you that are clapping, we need 500 volunteers. I'm taking note. All right. R.C. Sproul said this about, you know, you think about it, you say, well, if Christ, so Christ, when he came on the cross, right, he, it was the first of, 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 the, uh, of the head crushing. When Christ came to the cross and he died for us, if you put your faith in him, then what happened is he has removed the power of Satan from your life. He cannot take your salvation. You're saved. He cannot remove your, your status as a child of God. You're a child of God, either daughter or son. That doesn't change because you put your faith in Christ. He can't take that away. He can't take the fact that you're going to heaven away. All he can do is try to influence you to not live in the vibrant Christian life that God called you to do. Because if he can pull you down and get you discouraged and get you to quit, and I'm not going to that church anymore because somebody looked at me wrong or they said something, and I'm going to hold a grudge for the rest of my life. Oh, Satan loves grudges. And he'll keep you from going and serving and plugging in and giving and making the church strong. That's what he can do, but he can't take any of the other things away. So um, Jesus, when he went to the cross, he crushed the head. This was an incremental crushing. But let me tell you something. The head crushing isn't over until he comes back again. And he takes, he takes all dominion. He, he rules this, this world. Jesus comes to rule, to take over. And then ultimately, Satan is cast into the lake of fire with all of his demons. They'll be tormented day and night forever, it says in Revelation. There will be an end to him. And so I want to read. I, I, do I have time to read? I don't know if I have time to read this. Preach the word. Um, ver, number three, to, uh, Jesus was born to bring victory through death. Genesis 3.15 says, and you shall bruise his heel. Who's he talking to? Who's God talking to? He's talking to the serpent. He says, you, serpent, will bruise his heel. It's the same word for crush. It's the same word as attack. It's that same word, shoop. He's saying, you're going to bruise his heel. You're going to deal a blow, but it won't be ultimately fatal. And so the third point is to bring victory over death, through death. And this, is when, this was fulfilled when Christ died on the cross. The serpent sunk his teeth in, into his heel, Christ's heel, you know, figuratively speaking, inflicting a temporary death. In other words, when in the process of Jesus crushing the head of the serpent, the serpent bit him and it inflicted the poison of death. Jesus went to the cross. It's all figurative language for literal, for literally, literally happened. Jesus went to the cross and it, by going to the cross, he literally, I gotta, I gotta read Colossians. This is what happened at the cross. You ready? Um, when you were dead, the, he's, Paul the Apostle speaking to the church at Coloss. Like, imagine him speaking to us. He's saying, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, basically when Satan had power over you, 
God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Everything that was going to condemn you to hell, when Jesus came, he canceled the debt of sin that you owed. Taking it away and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them at the cross. Do you know what Jesus did for you? Here's what happens. Your sin demands judgment. My sin deserves judgment. Why is it that the cross changes everything? Because I was guilty before a holy God, unable to come into the presence of God. I was full of sin and he's a holy God. There's no way that I could have inhabited the kingdom, inhabited heaven without a mediator. I needed the seed of the woman to come, Jesus. And what he did is he satisfied the wrath of God. It's called propitiation, a big, a big theological word. He satisfied the wrath of God <laughs> and he went to a bloody cross. Can you think of a better gift at Christmas? And he took upon himself my sin. And when God saw his son on the cross, he saw all of our sin. And then he allowed his son to suffer the judgment that we all deserved. It all came down on him because there had to be a price paid for us to be back into the garden, to get back into the presence of God. You see, Eden is where it all started. And God's trying to get us back into the garden again, into his presence. It's an eternal garden. It's going to be filled with God's goodness and perfection and everything. Bethlehem leads us back to Eden. Jesus went to the cross and my sins were judged. And listen, when Christ pays a price, when he gave his life, I have no right to bring up my past as if it has an impact on my present or my future. Because if I keep thinking about, if I keep walking around with the guilt and the shame of sin, if I keep carrying the burden of my past on my shoulders, then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm in, insulting the God of grace. <laughs> we can't do it anymore. We gotta say, Christ died on the cross for my sin. He paid the price. My sins were judged. The wrath of God was satisfied. And now I'm free and I'm his and I'm a child of God and my sins are forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven. And that's who I am because he's a faithful and a good God. I wonder today if you know this Jesus. I wonder today if you're tired of being under the authority of the serpent's voice and you'd like to come under the king's uh, guidance and under his loving uh, 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 work in your life. I wonder if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, Jesus paid a price for my sin. Why would I reject him? I'm ready to receive him today. So I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer basically responding to what God already did. You see, the only way we can access this grace, this forgiveness, is if we respond by placing our faith in the gift that God gave, Jesus Christ. We have to respond. You don't get it automatically. God is, he's saying, here's a gift. Here's salvation. You can be free. You can be forgiven. You can have a whole new life, a new creation. But you have to say, I will take it. I will say yes. I will do whatever to become that person. And you're just a receiver and a believer. God's the one that did it. Follow me today in this prayer. Just pray it right out loud. Receive this new life in Christ that the devil can never take away again because Jesus crushed his head. Father God, I am a sinner. I've done a good job at that. But I repent for my sin. It was judged. It had to be judged. It was judged on the cross. Jesus took my sin and was penalized for it. Thank you for that, God. I believe he died, and I believe he rose again on the third day. I receive Christ today. I will come under your lordship. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Help me to walk with you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.